elsewhere. Menace for a child of 1918 My grandfather said to me as we sat on the wagon seat, Be sure to remember to always speak to everyone you meet. We met a stranger on foot. My grandfather's whip tapped his hat. Good day, sir, good day, a fine day. And I said it, and bowed where I sat. Then we overtook a boy we knew, with his big pet crow on his shoulder. Always offer everyone a ride. Don't forget that when you get older, my grandfather said. So Willie climbed up with us, but the crow gave a call and flew off. I was so worried. How would he know where to go? But he flew a little way at a time from fence post to fence post ahead. And when Willie whistled, he answered. A fine bird, my grandfather said. And he's well brought up. See, he answers nicely when he's spoken to. Man or beast, that's good manners. Be sure that you both always do. When automobiles went by, the dust hid the people's faces. But we shouted, good day, good day, fine day, at the top of our voices. When we came to Hustler Hill, he said that the mare was tired. So we all got down and walked, as our good manners required. Sestina September rain falls on the house. In the failing light, the old grandmother sits in the kitchen with the child beside the little marble stove, reading the jokes from the almanac, laughing and talking to hide her tears. She thinks that her equinoctial tears and the rain that beats on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac, but only known to her grandmother. The iron kettle sings on the stove, she cuts some bread and says to the child, It's time for tea now. But the child is watching the tea kettle's small, hard tears dance like mad on the hot black stove, the way the rain must dance on the house. Tidying up, the old grandmother hangs up the clever almanac on its string. Bird-like, the almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother and her teacup full of dark brown tears. She shivers and says she thinks the house feels chilly and puts more wood in the stove. It was to be, says the marble stove. I know what I know, says the almanac. With crayons the child draws a rigid house and a winding pathway. Then the child puts in a man with buttons like tears and shows it proudly to the grandmother. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, the little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac into the flower bed the child has carefully placed in the front of the house. Time to plant tears says the almanac. The grandmother sings to the marvellous stove, and the child draws another inscrutable house. First Death in Nova Scotia In the cold, cold parlour my mother laid out Arthur beneath the chromographs. Edward, Prince of Wales, with Princess Alexandra, and King George with Queen Mary. Below them on the table stood a stuffed loon, shot and stuffed by Uncle Arthur, Arthur's father. Since Uncle Arthur fired a bullet into him, he hadn't said a word. He kept his own counsel on his white frozen lake, the marble-topped table. His breast was deep and white, cold and caressable. His eyes were red glass, much to be desired. Come, said my mother, come and say good-bye to your little cousin Arthur. 
I was lifted up and given one lily of the valley to put in Arthur's hand. Arthur's coffin was a little frosted cake, and the red-eyed loon eyed it from his white, frozen lake. Arthur was very small. He was all white, like a doll that hadn't been painted yet. Jack Frost had started to paint him the way he always painted the maple leaf forever. He had just begun on his hair, a few red strokes, and then Jack Frost had dropped the brush and left him white forever. The gracious royal couples were warm in red and ermine. Their feet were well wrapped up in the ladies' ermine trains. They invited Arthur to be the smallest page at court. But how could Arthur go, clutching his tiny lily, with his eyes shut up so tight, and the roads deep in snow? Filling Station Oh, but it is dirty, this little filling station, oil-soaked, oil-permeated, to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. Father wears a dirty, oil-soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms, and several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station, all quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? It has a cement porch behind the pumps, and on it a set of crushed and grease-impregnated wickerwork. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite comfy. Some comic books provide the only note of color, of certain color. They lie upon a big, dim doily, draping a tabaret, part of the set, beside a big hirsute begonia. Why the extraneous plant? Why the tabaret? Why, oh why, the doily? Embroidered in daisy stitch, with marguerites, I think, and heavy with grey crotchet. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody waters the plant, or oils it, maybe. Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say, S-O, so, 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 to high-strung automobiles. Somebody loves us all. Sunday 4 a.m. An endless and flooded dreamland, lying low, cross and wheel-studded like a tic-tac-toe. At the right, ancillary, Mary's close and blue. Which Mary, Aunt Mary? Tall Mary Stearns, I knew. The old kitchen knife-box full of rusty nails is at the left, a high vox humana somewhere wailed. The grey horse needs shoeing. It's always the same. What are you doing there, beyond the frame? If you're the donor, you might do that much. Turn on the light, turn over. On the bed a smutch. Black and gold gesso on the altered cloth. The cat jumps to the window. In his mouth a moth. Dream, dream confronting, now the cupboard's bare. The cat's gone a-hunting, the brook feels for the stair. The world seldom changes, but the wet foot dangles, until a bird arranges two notes at right angles. Sandpiper the roaring alongside he takes for granted, and that every so often the world is bound to shake. He runs, he runs to the south, finical, awkward, in a state of controlled panic, 
a student of Blake. The beach hisses like fat. On his left, a sheet of interrupting water comes and goes and glazes over his dark and brittle feet. He runs, he runs straight through it, watching his toes, watching, rather, the spaces of sand between them, where, no detail too small, the Atlantic drains rapidly backwards and downwards. As he runs, he stares at the dragging grains. The world is a mist, and then the world is minute and vast and clear, the tide is higher or lower. He couldn't tell you which. His beak is focused. He is preoccupied, looking for something, something, something. Poor bird, he is obsessed. The millions of grains are black, white, tan and grey, mixed with quartz grains, rose and amethyst. From Trollope's Journal, Winter, 1861 As far as statues go, so far there's not much choice. There are either Washingtons or Indians, a whitewashed, stubby lot, his country's father or his foster sons. The White House in a sad, unhealthy spot, just higher than Potomac's swampy brim. They say the present president has got ague or fever in each backwards limb. On Sunday afternoon I wandered, rather I floundered, out alone. The air was raw and dark, the marsh half ice, half mud. This weather is normal now, a frost and then a thaw and then a frost. A hunting man, I found the Pennsylvania Avenue, heavy ground. There all around me in the ugly mud, hoof-pocked, uncultivated, herds of cattle, numberless, wandering steers and oxen, stood, beef for the army, after the next battle. Their legs were caked the colour of dried blood, their horns were wreathed with fog. Poor, starving, dumb, or lowing creatures, never to chew the cud or fill their maws again. The effluvium made that damned anthrax on my forehead throb. I called a surgeon in, a young man, but with a sore throat himself, he did his job. We talked about the war, and as he cut away, he croaked out, Sir, I do declare everyone sick. The soldiers poison the air. Visit to St. Elizabeth's, 1950 This is the house of Bedlam. This is the man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is the time of the tragic man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is a wristwatch telling the time of the talkative man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is a sailor wearing the watch that tells the time of the honoured man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is the roadstead all of board reached by the sailor wearing the watch that tells the time of the old brave man that lies in the house of Bedlam. These are the years and the walls of the ward, the winds and clouds of the sea of board. Sailed by the sailor, wearing the watch that tells the time of the cranky man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is a Jew in a newspaper hat that dances weeping down the ward over the creaking sea of board, beyond the sailor, winding his watch that tells the time of the cruel man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is a world of books gone flat, this is a Jew in a newspaper hat that dances weeping down the ward over the creaking sea of board of the batty sailor that winds his watch that tells the time of the busy man that lies in the house of Bedlam. 
This is a boy that pats the floor to see if the world is there, is flat, for the widowed Jew in the newspaper hat that dances weeping down the ward, waltzing the length of a weaving board by the silent sailor that hears his watch, that ticks the time of the tedious man that lies in the house of Bedlam. These are the years and the walls and the door that shut on a boy that pats the floor to feel if the world is there and flat. This is a Jew in a newspaper hat that dances joyfully down the ward into the parting seas of board, past the staring sailor that shakes his watch that tells the time of the poet, the man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is the soldier home from the war. These are the years and the walls and the door that shut on a boy that pats the floor to see if the world is round or flat. This is a Jew in a newspaper hat that dances carefully down the ward, walking the plank of a coffin board with the crazy sailor that shows his watch that tells the time of the wretched man that lies in the house of Bedlam.